You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, welcome to another fantastic news episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul, and I am here with the everly increasing famous personality, Haya Costello. And for all of you who have been emailing me, yes, it is Haya, like a karate chop, all right? There you go. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. Pleasure to be here again. <laughs> it is always awesome to chat with you each and every week. I look forward to it probably as much as everyone else who listens to this show, so thank you for your time. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So it seems like we are in trance in another week of news that showcases the ever-evolving industry and how some power players may not end up being power players for long, as there is a great opportunity for other competitors to come into the market. But we're also hearing increased reports of nefarious drones, and yet it begs the question, are these reports truly accurate? What do you have for us, Haya? Yeah, this first article takes us to uh, the United Kingdom, where uh, apparently last year, so 2018, the number of drone incidents has increased by a third. Now, probably uh, this, this might be caused by an increased awareness of people in general about drones, so you may get more reports just because of that. But in this case, they say we had 125 dangerously close drone encounters or drone incidents in 2018, which is up about a third from 93 incidents in the previous year and only 71 in 2016. Now, 39 of these incidents occurred at the busiest airport, Heathrow. Of course, it's a real concern. However, the thing is also that uh, in many of these cases, uh, there is no hard evidence of these drones actually having been there. So you got to keep that in mind. It is very interesting because if you remember all the reports from the United States, I think it was a, at least last year, a couple of years back, and they had something like 700 reports of near misses with drones. And when you actually went into the reports, half the reports were birds. And a lot of the reports were... We saw a drone a mile out while we were on approach moving at 150 miles oh, an yeah. hour. And it's just like, guys, the human eye is not possible to see a drone that's that size at that distance moving at that yeah. speed. That's uh, that's a very good point. I mean, the drones right now are like the favorite culprits. Uh, everybody has discovered that if there's something wrong, you can easily point to drones. And in many cases, people will buy that story. And we'll actually get into another example that we wrote about yesterday uh, that, that details this even more. But going back to what happened in the UK, uh, there's the head of the flight safety at Balpa, which is the British Pilots Union. Uh, this guy's name is Rob Hunter. And he said that the sharp increase in drone incidents was incredibly concerning and that a drone coming into contact with an airliner or a helicopter could prove disastrous. So this guy is kind of stirring up fear uh, among the public. He continues to say that the issue with these drone reports is also that there is no real clear definition. Uh, it's all based on the opinion of the pilot or air traffic services personnel. So there is no technical definition of uh, what a drone incident really entails. It's it's really based on what a pilot or air service personnel might have seen or might have thought they saw while approaching a uh, landing. So like you mentioned as well, it's it's hard when you're going so fast, of course, to, uh, to make sure that it's not a balloon or a plastic bag uh, flying in the winds, but it actually is a drone. So it's hard to know exactly what to make of these numbers. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because, again, it's so difficult to see something so small as a pilot. And, you know, the fact that these reports really come down to subjectivity really erodes the credibility and authority of these reports. But I will give, you know, that uh, particular source, the guy that they're talking about, he says, well, this may not be as many drone sightings as there really are. I would give him credit because as a journalist, he's stoking up emotion and that's what it's all about is to get a reaction. Yeah. Unfortunately, oh. we've been there, done that, and we know that uh, it's a false flag. 
Well, in this case, he actually suggests that the real number might be a lot higher than the 125 reported incidents because of the restrictive uh, definition. I would actually go ahead and, and argue the opposite, that because so many people are mistaking other objects for being drones, that the actual number might as well be a lot lower than the 125 uh, drone incidents that are reported. Even DJI, not too long ago, came out with a statement warning people to be cautious when they point to drones as being the culprit because like I said, uh, take a look at Gatwick or Heathrow or even Newark, where we had a drone incident recently. In all three of these cases, we haven't really seen any evidence of a drone actually being involved. It's just people saying that they might have seen a drone. And when you ask for the real evidence, there there hasn't been any presented as of yet. So it might be interesting on the Discovery Channel here coming up, we may be seeing uh, unknown drone sightings because in the 90s and 80s, it was all about UFOs. And now it's all yeah. about the drones. So who knows? Oh, I, there may be an investigative series on this coming up. <laughs> who knows? Well, if that happens, we'll be sure to uh, to report on that as well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting. But you know, you talked about an article that you had um, that had come up yesterday, but yeah, yeah. Uh, concerning a story from last year where someone had also believed that a drone strike had caused a plane crash. Was that actually? Did that end up being the case? Yeah, that's a very interesting one. This is uh, a guy by the name of Rod Fawn in New Zealand, and he was flying a micro light airplane, a small airplane, together with his son last year. And at some point, the windshield shattered, and they had to make a uh, emergency crash landing. Uh, the pilot was injured. I believe his son was injured as well. Um, somewhat serious. The interesting thing is that the pilot, Rob Vaughn, is actually a journalist himself. So you would expect a certain level of uh, accuracy in, in his reporting. And he blames a drone for the sudden collapse or failure of the airplane's uh, windshield. Um, now we're a year later. This, so this happened uh, pretty much in April of, uh, of 2018. The Civil Aviation Authority in New Zealand, the CAA, investigated the crash and they have not found any evidence of a drone being involved in this crash. And they're pointing to prolonged UV exposure of the windshield, which would deteriorate uh, the material and if not uh, fixed in time, could lead to a sudden uh, drastic failure of the windshield. So it seems that that is very likely the cause of, uh, of the windshield collapsing. And again, um, no proof of any drone uh, being involved in this incident. Well, that's good news for all drone pilots out there who are flying yeah. responsibly. So very good. Yeah. The, luckily, of course, uh, the people involved were injured, but not severely injured. So at least this story has a happy ending in that sense. Uh, but it is an example of people pointing to drones uh, very quickly without being thorough in their, in their research and investigations. True. You know, I'm glad this was a happy ending, but when it comes to upcoming news about new drone product releases, it seems like there is not a happy ending because last news show we were talking about, hey, maybe at NAB they'll be launching a Phantom 5. Yeah. And literally right after we finished that show, we confirmed that DJI is not even going to be there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you mentioned that you didn't see their name on the list of exhibitors. And as a result, I contacted DJI and Adam Lisberg, who's the spokesperson for DJI North America. He got back to us with an email and I'll read it to you. He said that we've had traditionally a booth at NEB and other large events for the last several years. But we've decided to refocus our promotion strategy, re-evaluating the best ways to support the professional imaging market and our pro customers. So we're considering alternative options. We're going to explore other ways to reach this customer base and demonstrate our support for them. Now, as you know, uh, last year they launched the DJI Pro brand, which is focused on professional users, photography and uh, filmmaking mostly. Um, but yeah... They're not going to be at NEB this year, so we're not going to see a new Phantom, a Phantom 5 launched at NEB um, or any other products for that matter from DJI. Well, it allows other people to essentially steal the show at NAB because NAB was one of the first big shows that all the drone manufacturers were attending simply for the fact because, well, you have a flying video camera. You know, it makes, yeah. it makes sense that you're at the National Association of Broadcasters. In fact, that's where I got to meet the DJI team for the first time. Back in 2014, when I was instructing at the mm -hmm. National Association of Broadcasters, actually one of the first uh, pilots to do so. And that being said, it's really shocking that they are not going to be there. And it is very interesting. But, you know, when we were talking pre-show, I was saying, you know, it would be really cool yeah. if Autel was there because 
you know, I've been flying this Autel Evo and it, it's really amazing. I think it actually can definitely be a, a competitor to DJI. But when looking up whether they're going to be there or not, they're not going to be there either. So, you know, it, it leaves the door wide open for someone to go into that market and steal the show. Yeah, exactly. Of course, the question is, is anybody going to step up to that opportunity? And are we going to see any real drone news coming out of the NEB show in Las Vegas this year? Well, I've been hearing a lot of people touting the AEE brand, which is another Chinese manufacturer of drones. But I have no experience with them myself. And I've been skeptical uh of a lot of these other drones, especially because for a while they became commodities. So I'm really yeah. interested to see what happens at NAB. But speaking of an evolution of the market, it also looks like there's finally been an evolution for the market when it comes to drones becoming a logistical you know, solution for packages. What do you have? Yeah, uh, this is the news about UPS working together with uh, Maternet, which is a uh, company uh, that was previously testing in Switzerland. They've been working on a drone-based delivery solution to deliver packages in the last mile delivery, as it's called in the industry, meaning uh, from the regional or local warehouse to the final delivery address. In Zurich, Switzerland, Matternet has done a, uh, a large number of deliveries and they've proven to be quite successful with it, uh, being able to deliver packages both faster and more economical as well as more environmentally friendly than compared to delivering packages with a, a diesel or gas-powered truck. Now, Matternet is working together with UPS and they've been granted by the FAA the approval to run a test in North Carolina. So they're working together with uh, a bunch of different departments, one of them being the hospital in, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they're doing about 10 flights a day. And they've got a launch pad in one location at the hospital and another one at the campus. And they fly drones back and forth uh, about 10 flights per day. And they cross that distance in about three minutes. So it seems to be a very fast and effective way of delivering blood samples and other medical samples. Wow, this is really great. This is fantastic that we're finally seeing an evolution of drones being used logistically, especially in last mile delivery. It is interesting, though, how they chose North Carolina of all places to fly. Because while North Carolina has been advancing the drone industry in many ways, they also still hold it back by having their own licensing and registration program, which is a direct breach of the FAA's preemption clause. Yeah. So it's surprising that the FAA would be so supportive of them, especially after the FAA deleted all their tweets about North Carolina's registration program, which was actually really funny. But then again, you got to give North Carolina credit because they're really advancing and pushing the industry. So frankly, that's exciting. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, when the... Um uh, UAS IPP, or so the integration pilot program was launched last year. They only had 10 spots available for testing. And I believe there were like 149 applications submitted. So they had to be pretty strict, I guess, in which ones uh, finally made the cuts. And yeah, this project in North Carolina is one of them. What is also good to add is that Matternet will be using their M2 quadcopter to make these deliveries. And these drones are able to fly 12 and a half miles and carry up to five pounds of cargo which is actually quite a bit if you think about it. So not only is it quite a bit, but aren't most packages un like sub five pounds anyway? Doesn't Amazon say that like 75% of their packages are less than five pounds? I would think so. When we were researching this article, like we're talking here about uh, medical samples and blood samples, and typically those tend to be very small and lightweight packages. So there, of course, with medical supplies, there's a high level of urgency. The packages are small, so they're easily uh, attached to a drone. So it kind of makes the perfect situation to use drones for deliveries and to prove that concept. You know, it's really interesting, too. You wonder what safety protocols they put inside of this bird um, because they're delivering, you know, you know, biochemical fluids. Yeah, it's um, it's a good point that you make there. Um, what I can point out here is that in this case, they have a remote pilot on standby that uh, who monitors the entire flight. So he doesn't take any action unless it's necessary, of course, but he's on standby monitoring the flight to make sure that nothing crazy happens. He's ready to switch it into attitude mode and just start taking over. <laughs> take over and <laughs> <laughs> fly medical supplies elsewhere. <laughs> I hope he knows the tornado pattern. Anyway, that is honestly awesome in the fact that we're finally moving forward here in the United States. Because if you remember, 2013, Amazon said drones are going to rule the sky yeah. by 2018. It's now 2019. Yep. So we have we have some ways to go. I mean, I think... 
technologically speaking, the, the capabilities are definitely there. I think uh, for the most part, there are uh, legal and regulatory hurdles that need to be overcome. Things like uh, flying over crowds, flying at night, flying beyond light of sight. Um, all those issues need to be solved. And as well, of course, remote ID. Those issues do need to be solved, and the government shutdown definitely didn't help the speed no, no. and efficiency of that. But something I will say is that we're really excited for the new NPRM. If you're listening to the show and you have not commented on the new NPRM about flight over people, please take the time in the next week to go and comment on the website for that. Um, I will try to find a link and give it to our editor so that way you can click it directly. But uh, as a message directly from Vic Moss, please, please go comment on that NPRM and please put some thought into it. Don't just write, oh, don't do it, or we need full... Don't do that, okay? Put some thought into it, all right? But Haya, what else do you have for us? It seems like this... This news episode is all about crashing. Yeah, uh, and flying over people. The next article takes us to Brooklyn, New York, where a uh, very well-known rabbi uh, who had unfortunately passed away, um, during his burial, there was a large group of people that uh, that gathered. And if you look at the videos on, on YouTube, like we're talking about a, a pretty pretty decent sized crowd, probably about 100,000 people that came together. And one person decided to fly a drone and, and get a different vantage point. And for reasons unknown, that drone landed and landed on top of the head of a NYPD police officer. So of all the places you can uh, you can land your drone, of course, this was not the best uh, spot to choose. Uh, we're not quite sure what happened. We don't know what kind of drone was involved. Uh, we do know that the police officer in question wasn't really injured. So luckily, nothing bad happened in that sense. What I did find is that uh, the drone operator apparently told the police that he had only had the drone for one week. So it seems that in this case, it was a very uh, new drone pilot and probably he wasn't aware of the rules that apply for flying drones in New York City. And there are plenty of those rules. Uh, basically, you're not allowed to fly drones in New York. Uh, there's only five places where you can fly drones legally. So this guy's in a little bit of uh, hot water, unfortunately. Well, maybe it'll set the example for all the other Best Buy pilots out there. Yeah, exactly, yeah, right? right. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I had to, I had to do that. I, I couldn't resist. Uh, no worries, no worries. I'm just, I'm just glad that nobody got seriously injured in this case because we really don't need another story of uh, of somebody getting injured because of a drone. Especially a member of public safety. I couldn't agree more. So definitely. Yeah. Um, is that it for the news this week? I know there's one other piece of news that will make kids very happy. Yeah, we have one more, one more. Uh, DJI and Rice, uh, they just launched earlier this week the DJI Tello Iron Man Edition. And it comes also with a slightly upgraded app with new features from Iron Man's Friday. The drone sells for $129. Um, if... The Tello is your thing, then this may be the drone to choose. For kids, I think it's a great drone. It's not too expensive. Uh, it flies quite well, actually. The video footage, of course, is not so great. Also, the drone is very lightweight. So if you plan to fly this thing outside, then make sure to pick a day when there's hardly any wind, because as soon as it's windy, this, uh, this thing will fly away by itself, pretty much. But for indoor flying and for people who are thinking about getting into drone flying the tello is not a bad drone to start with at all uh if you're getting one for your kids then i guess the uh, ironman edition is a nice one to start with totally totally true totally true well Haya, i can't say thank you enough for bringing this week's drone news here to the ask drone you podcast as always uh, i'm excited for uh if there are any things that come out of nab this next week yeah. and we will definitely be covering that next week so Everyone, stay tuned to the show. Also, I want to say thank you for the reviews that you've been putting on iTunes and Stitcher. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the show so that the shows automatically pop up on your phone. And again, if you think that we're helping out the industry, then do us a favor and share the show with a friend. We would greatly appreciate that. And Haya, as always, it has been a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for having me on the show, Paul, and uh, we'll see you next week. Sounds good, Haya. Well, that's going to do it for us today, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks again for watching. Thanks for your support. We greatly appreciate it. And as always, this is another fantastic episode of Ask Drone You. Drone You.